I'm here with Brenton Nets, and we're doing a follow-up on the story that um, we talked about a while ago. Brenton, you've had some real difficulty with your son and the care that your ex-wife has been um, seeking for him. Can you just tell us what it is that, um, that's happening with your son? Yeah, yeah, I can try. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's becoming a really frustrating process and taking too long, in my opinion, to try to get uh, uh, Miles and I reunited. There, there seems to be always these infinite kind of obstacles and steps that can be put in place. Um, and, and then trying to navigate those, you know, is, is really frustrating. So what's happening now is through uh, our legal efforts with my attorney and I, we've gotten to a position where it would seem um, too obvious to not let us start to the process of coming back together, you know, since I haven't seen my son in about three years. But it, they're trying to kind of direct it in the direction of just it's always on screens, you know, it's always like through Zoom or Skype or something like that, or at least that's going to be the, the process for a while which I, I, we've agreed to for a few sessions, but I do think the priority needs to be like us coming back together in person as quickly as possible. See, I had and thought that like you would, I had actually thought that you had an appointment that you were going to be reunited with him a while ago. Yeah, well, it, it had to start out with uh, my attorney, Robert Roby, and I, and then meeting up with Sarah and Sarah's attorney via Zoom to kind of work out that, the, those parameters, you know, it's, um, yeah, it, it's, it's, so we did that and now we're waiting for that to be written up and then we got to sign off of it. And it's, I, I, what came from that is, um, uh, well, okay. So what, what's, what's going to be a challenge? And I think this is a pretty common tactic by, we'll just call the other side is the whole name issue. It seems to, everything seems to funnel down into, are you going to affirm your child based on their new identity? And so in this case, Sarah has renamed my son Miley, right? And calling him a she. And there, I noticed that they're making a big deal about that, um, where it's, you know, it's, there's a lot of redundant, you know, and then Miley and she, and, you know, and, I'm, and if you slip into that slipstream in my position or, you know, in, in, in the position I'm in, then it just by default becomes you're kind of another, you're, you're another affirmer. And I will not, yeah, you got a question? Yeah. Has he legally had his name changed? I don't believe so. No, it just became like the school's going along with it. Uh, Central Care is going, I mean, everybody's going along with it. So that's where I get really confused as to how, how can these um, agencies, schools, courts, um, clinics, how can they just um, go along with this when, you know, you have one parent who's saying, you know, it's a girl and you're saying, no, he's clearly a biological male. How is it that they just automatically um, go with the affirmation? I don't understand that. Yeah. yeah, it's a good question. And it really does come down to, I think, I mean, I'm always open for someone to give me a proper explanation, but I've never heard it because I just really don't think there is one, is uh, you know, we're, there's, we're talking about people that acknowledge reality. I mean, I guess biological reality, right? And people that don't. And part of the gaslighting process is to, through the social, uh, the social transitioning is you take a young child and you just start calling them by their new name, kind of like a cult would do, right? A cult renames you and shaves your head or whatever they do to kind of initiate you. So pretty soon it's like you're a new name. You're a name of the opposite gender, and then everyone starts calling you the pronouns of the opposite gender, and then it's like it, it's it's a cult programming. And so when you're on the outside of it, which I am, you know, it's like, well, I don't feel like I have a um, I, there's no option for me to go along with that. But then it becomes, you know, in, in my case, you know, Miles is pretty deep into this, unfortunately, and I'm wrestling with how I'm going to navigate this through the middle of, you know, well, I'm not going to, I can't call you Miley because that just become to him, it just signals that I'm going along with it. Right. Um, but then if I call him Miles, he's, he's been, you know, somewhat conditioned to reject that or to be hostile towards it. You know, you know, he could, if we were, if I was talking to him now, he could slam the computer down and that's the end of the conversation. Right. So 
Um, what I what I did uh, in our last meeting is we asked if we could find a, another name, like a nickname. You know, maybe I, I suggested M. You know, just like M, which stands for Miles or, or Miley. I guess if that's what we need to. Um, and they're checking, so hopefully that will be a compromise that we can go with, just to just to get off the the, the drawing board. Because I do think it's a tactic. You know, to say that again is like by the other side is like you just trip them up at the starting line. So there's just no bringing this child out of the indoctrination and the cult. Well, and it also, it's so frustrating because it's just another instance where, you know, you have to go through all these legal hoops just in order to see your son. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, so it, it addresses the parental rights issue, which I know, you know, Jeffrey's doing a great job at talking about and Robert Hoagland's doing a great job talking about. And, um, and I'm trying to point that out as well is that this is a really insidious and effective on their part way to undermine all parental rights. And, that, and it's such, it's such a uh, found, you, you can't have a civilized society without parents being able to raise their children, right? So for those who are less familiar with your case, can you start from um, the beginning and just kind of give us a little bit of a brief history? We do, have, we do have that in another interview, but just here, just kind of give a brief summary of what happened. And, and especially, I'm curious about what happened with um, his therapist, and, and how that has really affected you. Because my understanding is, is that the therapist he went to used an approach of reparenting, basically taking on the role of the father, which is your yes. role. And so yes. would you mind just talking about that a little bit? Yeah, I can try. I can do it. I can try to do it in such a way that it won't take up too much time. But um, yeah, it's uh, so... So Miles is autistic, and I do think that's um, you know something that always has to be brought in... Um, to be mentioned because I, you know, Sarah says he's severe, as he actually used the term severely, severely autistic. I don't believe so. I, th I think he is mildly autistic, if you want to say that. And it's been extremely exacerbated. I mean, it's just been turned into a, uh, you know, a, a, a mind erasing, scrambling, you know, this stuff that's been done to him has made it a whole lot worse. And I guess they just keep, they've turned it into something now that it's called severe autism, right? which I'll return to that, you know, to kind of make my point in a way. But uh, he was diagnosed with that at age four. And, um, and I, I know I've mentioned this in another interview is I, at the end of the day, I really don't care. Like, it's just, I just take my kid the way he is. I, like, I'm the only one that's just taken exactly how he is. And so he did start to have interest in what could traditionally be called uh, girl, girl interests like Disney princesses and dolls and stuff like that. Um, and and I've tried to make the point with people is like there was a time in where that could be harmless and it really was, but we're living a time now where that's going to be capitalized on and your child is in extreme danger if that happens, you know? So like if that starts happening and I've been meaning to try to make like a video about this day, like a warning to parents or something is like, you know, if your child just starts having an interest in other things, some, someone around your child's orbit is going to use that if, you know, and against you and they can just cascade into a snowball effect where your child's being taken from you you know it can get that extreme that's really scary because we're really living in an age where on one hand we're told to allow our kids to be gender non-conforming but on the other hand if we do that there is a good chance that somebody will swoop in and tell them that they're transgender and try and convince the child and 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 really um, usurp the parent's role yeah, that's such a good point. Yeah, it's ex that's exactly right. Yeah, it's it's a trap. It's almost like a trap, you know. It's like, yeah, you you want to you want to let your kids just be who they are, you know. I mean, it, yeah, it you said it perfectly. I don't even need to explain it better. <clears throat> so, uh, I just what I did is early on it's because I had no idea where any of this stuff could go, you know. And I it would be that who could right. I just went along with it. You know, I just go like, okay, well, well, if you want to, we go to the thrift store and we're like, pick out a bunch of Disney movies. That's fine. I never got to watch these when I was a kid. So, you know, it was, everything was fine and dandy. Well, it just, what happened is behind the scenes when he was with his mother at her house, this was going far beyond just dolls and Disney princesses and interests. It was like, she's trying to convince him, well, you can be a princess and you know, get, you know, you, you like the princesses and the dresses they wear. You can wear dresses. And it just, it turned into this sick thing that, she kept from me, you know, probably wisely so, knowing that if I could start fighting it early, you know, maybe it wouldn't have taken off. <clears throat> and then by age seven, um, the, it, I found out about it. 
I discovered it and I confronted her and then it turned into a, well, you're going to have to start addressing Miles as Miley. He's going to wear dresses at your house if he wants to. If he comes home and says you're not letting him, then you're going to have to take him back to court. I couldn't believe it. I wish I would have fought, fought it at the time, but I just didn't know and I wasn't in a position to do so. And so it, I just ducked out hoping I could return when some, he grows out of some of this, not knowing that it can continue to escalate into the point of he started seeing Troy Weber Brown, who is a counselor at Centricare in the gender and sexuality clinic for children, which I can't believe those even exist. I mean, a lot of people can't, you know, why should they? Um, and he, in an extreme way, started to um, indoctrinate my autistic son and, you know, affirming wouldn't even be a strong enough word. I mean, just kind of reprogramming him into a miniature version of himself, calling himself a them, a there, a they, you know, all that weird pronoun stuff. Um, and like you said, just, re just basically stepping into my shoes under the empowerment of Sarah, his mother. Um, you know, it, which is a strange thing. I guess that's the model that she would want for her child, which I think just points in the direction of maybe her mental health more than even what the rest of this does. And uh, I didn't know it was going on because I wasn't paying close enough attention. I was just mildly kind of, you know, paying attention at that point, not even knowing they could go there. And uh, it, it was about three years where Troy River Brown just worked him and molded him into a, an absolute mess, which I'm still uh, praying and hoping and researching and trying to find a way to start slowly bringing Miles out of this. And I can tell it's going to be a huge battle because it's just me against the system. And, you know, Sarah has the entire system behind her that's affirming all of this, the schools and the medical system and her and all her friends. So um, does that kind of answer the question you were asking? Yeah. One of the questions I had, I didn't realize that he was um, being affirmed at school. So is he presenting as a, as he, is he dressing as a girl and, and going by Miley at school? Yeah, as far as I can tell, um, there's a little bit of a complication in that in the sense that Miles um, does not do very well in school settings or just social settings in general. Part of his, again, I guess they just have to use a catch-all of just autism. You know, he's he can be um, very temperamental and explosive, and he just kind of really just wants to be left alone. That's kind of his personality is, you know, he just wants to live in his own little world. He, I think he just kind of has some, like, cognitive dissidence or what you call it, disassociation going on and things like that. So he does have real problems that unfortunately are just not being addressed. They're just being kind of blanketed over by this, this evil thing of this gender dysphoria diagnosis. Um, so, but yes, every time he finds himself in a new kind of school situation, um, uh, they do, they do go by Sarah's wishes, which are to call him Miley and call him a she and a them and a there and a they and affirm him. I have had some success in kind of interjecting myself into it and basically um, reminding people that it's Sarah's not some kind of immaculate conception or, you know, widower that doesn't have another parent involved. And some of them have started to honor it, especially since I've gotten legal representation and make, they have to take me more seriously. So. You know, it's a shame that you have to actually um, go to court in order to have your son recognized as a boy by school authorities. It, it, you don't even know where to start to try to explain it. It's just crazy. Can you talk a little bit more about um, Miles' experience with Troy Weber Brown? Have you, yeah, and sort of talk about how um, this happened without your consent or even um, ability to, to control? Because it sounds like you weren't able to even get records at one point. So, so have you ever like gone into a session with, with Miles and with Troy Weber Brown? Or are you just completely locked out of that process? Yeah, yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. Um, well, it's, so no, I've never been able to go into a session. They purposely try to keep it a secret or keep it so, you know, it, it, it's funny because it, it, you would think when people are trying to keep secrets in a way they're betraying that they know what they're doing is not, right or it's you know a, a, a controversial or something like that right um but what they'll do is they'll just say well it's like a safety issue or it's just like they're always using this kind of guise of like they're the victims and there's so much you know so much hostility being directed towards the trans community and things like that we have to kind of keep it a secret and so 
it's almost like this shadow medical um, uh, subset to, you know, at least I found that in Centricare care where they just almost like, it's like a black site. Like you don't even know it's there. You have to kind of go through these rabbit trails to keep and discover that they have a new wing that was just added in the past few years. It's like directed towards child sexuality. And, and so I think if I remember correctly, how I kind of found out is I did, I went, I had to go, I live about five hours north um, than where they live currently. And it happens to be in another state. It's the upper peninsula of Michigan. And so I had to go to a doctor to go do something. And they asked me for my records. And so I said, okay, I'll, you know, I'll go back to where I used to live. And I started looking on what they call my chart, which is all your online records. And it, and it just happened. I have a link to miles. Right. And so I'm, oh, okay. And I just went over to see what's going on with miles. And it just opened up this, <laughs> hundreds of pages of just horrifying <laughs> session notes and things like that. And so I, it really was a huge shocker that my son is sitting in these behind closed door weekly sessions with this person that should never be allowed around children and convincing him and sexualizing him and giving him homework of like basically soft core anime to go home and watch and transgender, um, you know, homework. It's basically what it is. It's transgender homework. Um, and, uh, you know, something that's really caught on and it's shocking. It should be is that, you know, they, within the session notes, they were, he, and were convincing my son that he's, it, a transgender lesbian, which th try to unpack that one. How do you make sense with that one? On top of the fact that he was only seven, eight, nine years old at the time. Um, so yeah, I couldn't believe it. It was hugely shocking. I think that's when it. I started realizing like I have to try to do something about this, and, the, and that's when I started to um, you know find out if there's anybody else who's paying any attention to this. And then it, and I, of course discovered Jeffrey Younger's case, and then it kind of took off from there. So I I kind of hate to ask you this because it, it seems like such a like a personal question but can you just describe how it felt because I'm, I'm trying to imagine like you just click on the link thinking sort of you know you'll see about his maybe his immunizations and his last physical and instead you just get hit with you know page upon page of what must have been very shocking yeah. well it does it feels like an absolute nightmare like I, I it I just I it uh what it feels like is like, I do believe there are just certain things in life that become these lines in the sand that if you take away from somebody um, or remove their ability to have some control in it, that it's, it just becomes, I guess, like a line in the sand. Right. And one of them would be, you know, taking away the, a person's ability to raise their own children in the way that you value, you know, giving them your values. And of course, I know, you know, I'm being, I'm a realist. I realize we live in a time where there's a lot of divorce and there's a lot of, you know, and there's just kind of levels to that where everyone juggles and does their best. But under that understanding, this is, this type of situation is such an extreme example where basically, and I don't think I'm being hyperbolic when I say it's almost like having your child kidnapped or abducted from you and, but you know, right where they are. And it's all sanctioned by the powers that be, power, the powers of the state, right? And on top of that, they force you to pay for it on a monthly basis. If not, they will drop the hammer on you. And, um, and they, are, they are indoctrinating your child with the worst possible worldview and ideology and character shaping and identity shaping gaslighting propaganda you could ever can try to conceive. It's it it it's so it just it's like your heart falls out and it there's no bottom and you wake up in the morning and you have a 10 second reprieve where the world started coming back into your head and you for, you're not thinking about it and then and then you, re, you remember it and it becomes this daily sort of haunting where you are you want to save your child but you don't go don't know how to go about doing it and so that's why in a way it's like it just becomes something i mean you like i have to do this you know i wish i was better at it i wish i was more effective i wish i knew how to you know just crack the code to try to make to fix this problem not just for myself and for my son but for the thousands of children that are caught up in this right but it, it's um yeah i, I just i it, it, i'd never in a million years would have thought that you could ever call this 
you know, parenting, or this would be a, a something to be considered like an experience in be, being a parent. Well, and when you describe that, it really strikes me that, that what you're talking about is that your son has been um, taken in by a cult, that this is, that this is really the way cults function. Um, the difference is, is that this cult is now state-sanctioned. State yes. Yeah, that's what makes it so hard to fight. I mean, it, it's like, it's becoming the establishment, you know, and our institutions have been corrupted to the point where now they are dictating the norm, I suppose. And it's so obvious to, you know, I should be obvious to anybody that they do not have our children's best interests at heart. Like I was just told a couple of days ago that um, in some school districts, um, now they're just right off the bat, like the first day of school, like we're introducing the whole class and it's um, everyone and introduce yourself with, your, with the pronoun that you want to be addressed by. And we're talking about like fourth graders and fifth graders. And it's like, this is opening a, just a, all it takes is one time where like there's some child that just is looking for friends the first day of school. And they're like, Oh, I think that girl's cool. And Oh, she just went by a different pronoun and I'm going to get on that bandwagon too. And then it just turns into this escalating nightmare. So you lose, you lose control of your child. I mean, it, it's that easy. It's, it's really um, like, as I listen to this, it's just, it's such a nightmare. And on some level, if it were just about pronouns and names, and what the person wore, it wouldn't be as big of a nightmare. But can you talk about what Miles is facing if your ex-wife has her way as far as medical transitioning? Yes, yeah, so that is that is the problem. We're not you know, just talking about it. Um, hopefully I'm not yelling at you, I don't mean to. <laughs> it's just, tell me if I am, but passionate. But yeah, it, um, if it was only that, like you said, it could probably still be worked with, even though that would be a less than ideal situation, you know? Um, but they have, you know, they, the other side, you know, they've introduced this whole other level that just becomes this point of no return, right? Where, and they will wrestle your right to stop your adolescent child from wrecking their life before they even know what they're doing to themselves. And, you know, everybody that's a parent should let that sink in. You know, it, it's like, you're just going about your day thinking you're doing the best you can, you know, like uh, to raise your child. And while there's these forces at work that are undermining your influence on your own child, and then to the point of taking them down a point of just destroying their body, destroying their body, destroying their lives, get, get put, putting them in danger of committing suicide. And just, you know, after they do all this, you know, not before. And it's like, not um, to mention lifelong medical um, difficulties and complications yeah. and, and being addicted to, to hormones. Um, yeah. Just maintenance, it, just mainly maintaining it. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's shocking to me when I hear you, I mean, you know, we hear about this, but, but talking to you, you know, your passion, your, it seems, um, completely reasonable. Whereas what they're doing is just, it, it does sound like a nightmare. It sounds like somebody just, just made this up. It doesn't seem like this could really be happening. And especially in the case of Miles and many, many others who have di you know, comorbid diagnoses. So Miles is also autistic. And so arguably is not ready to be making a decision, you know, regardless of his age about this. And these other kids who are suffering from other mental health issues, they're the ones who are, who are most vulnerable to this cult. And they're the ones who are um, who are being sucked in, and yet, arguably, th they're not able to to even um, consent to any of this because they have these additional mental health issues on top of whatever gender dysphoria they may or may not have. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so much more research uh, of really good research is coming out showing the link between autism and what they call gender dysphoria. Um, you know, it, it's going, it, given enough time, this is going to be kind of undeniable, I believe, because it's just, it's like half or more than half. And, you know, uh, autism is one of the many aspects of it, as far as I understand it, is, you know, children and people have a hard time just with their identities in general. And so you can see how this can work. Um, to, it ca the, this capitalizes on that, where the person's like, I don't know exactly who I am, you know, and it's like, and then they, then you take someone like Troy Over Brown, for example, that just comes in and says, I'll give you an identity. And he has an agenda to do so. 
And, uh, you know, it should be illegal that someone can capitalize on the, the characteristics of an autistic mind. Well, and I'm really um, concerned about the dynamic that is being set up between you and Miles for your, for your visits. Because what's happened is as a result of, of this ideology and the fact that the courts are buying into this, Miles has a lot more control over the relationship than you do. Um, and that's not the way a parent-child relationship is supposed to be. So you're, you're now having to, to come to Miles. And like you said, if at any point you do something that he doesn't like or that your ex-wife doesn't like, um, the computer can just be slammed shut and yep. you're, yep. you're, or, you know, and, and to me that, that puts you as a parent in such a um, vulnerable position that you should not be in as a parent. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you. You're always so good at articulating it that, that thank and that you're exactly right. It, it's another aspect or another level of this undermining of parental authority where, and the child knows it. I mean, you know, it's, this is our job, right? At the end of the day, you know, authority is real. And one of the legitimate authorities in life is uh, a parent has authority over their children so that they, because they know what's best for the child until that child hopefully knows what's best for themselves. And this whole process, this whole inverting of everything that works, that's timeless, right? Of, you know, and in, in my case, and I'm still trying to figure out how this is going to work because I really think it's kind of designed not to work. You know, it's like, okay, we're going to start this out on some screens, right? And at any time you say something that is going to offend a very confused 11-year-old autistic boy who's been convinced for years that he said somebody of the opposite gender, he can slam the computer down on you. And then it goes down in the legal record that this child doesn't want or no, you're not affirming him, or you're not accepting him as who he is. It just becomes this minefield that, that I think cannot be navigated without this kind of like sacred, um, this sacred understanding that at the end of the day, I'm, I'm his dad, right? I'm his dad. Like, I, you, you can say all you want, you know, the courts can say what all they want, the schools can say all they want. I suppose you can make the argument that like Sarah has somewhat equal say, you know, because she's also the parent, but and this is where the conundrum happens is where they, they find that little vis vision to kind of, you know, direct the, they find the parent that affirms and then they just, they just basically empower the parent that affirms. Right. So, you know, in this case, I would be the outsider parent that is not going along with the game. So that's the challenge and uh, you know, how to get those, people out of your way so that you can do your job to save your child that's what i'm trying to figure out how to do you know anyone that would that comes across this you know you have any ideas please i'm so easy to find i'm listening if you got any and i do get lots of great ideas and i, I could not do it without people that are giving me good advice but um but yeah that's the challenge it it, it almost seems like an insurmountable challenge but what do you do you can't give up on your child knowing where this is going well, and I'm, I'm thankful that you are fighting for Miles. He needs someone in his corner because right now he doesn't have anyone. And, and I just, it, it just, it's so sad for me to think of, you know, all I can think of is, is sort of the fact that you have, your role as a father has just been completely taken away from you. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, Aaron. Uh, you glitched out just there for a second. I want to make sure I understand what you just said. Can you say that again, please? Yeah, just I'm just tr grappling with the, with the fact that you, your role as a father has been completely taken away, and how that must feel. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it, it, so it, it it also reminds me of this kind of concept that I've learned, you know, in the past recently is this idea of having responsibility for someone or something without having authority over that someone or something. And if you think about it, it is a two sides of the same coin that cannot be separated, right? It's like, if you're going to ask somebody to have responsibility, then they have to have it within their power to, be, to have authority over that thing or person. Um, and when you separate those two, it's kind of like separating the atom. It's going to explode. You know, it's like, it just doesn't work. And that's what the courts are empowering and this whole system in general is empowering. Is it like, oh yeah, like I have, I have, you know, they would just say I have, um, in my case, you know, I'd, they'd say I have, uh, 
I have responsibility for my son. Like the, 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 the day I stop paying child support, it's, I'll never get away from that. Right. Um, but, but they've completely removed, you know, any sort of real authority over my son. So that becomes this in, in navigable, um, scenario, you know, and I, and I just can't help but to be cynical enough at this point to think that's all by design. It's gotta be, I mean, it's gotta be connected into the planned necessary destruction of the family in order to control the people. Is that going too far with that? Well, it, it, when I listen to what you're saying, it just, it sounds, I mean, it really does sound like the goal is to destroy the family. And the irony of it is that you're paying for all of this, that, that you have to pay child support to, to a woman who is undermining your authority and um, pay for medical visits to a therapist who is trying to replace you as a father. And so you're financially enabling the very thing that is Dis, you know, destroying your son and and um, creating this um, chasm between you and your son and your ability to parent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why that's legal? I, I would like to hear a good argument as to why that's legal. I, I don't think there is one, but they probably make it anyways because they're not they're not trafficking in logic and reason, right? That's the problem too. So, but you know, it's a uh, one one thing one way one i guess like something i'm working on and with my attorney to try to present um is and it should be really simple but of course we just got to kind of play the game to a certain extent but it's it's everything in, in my son's case everything has been tried as far as we know except for you know of course chemical castration i suppose they could make the argument like well you know they have like oh he should, all his problems are based on the fact that he wants to be a princess and let's make him one. And then all of his problems go away. Asinine. A everybody knows that. Anybody knows. That. Anybody that's paying hey, any attention knows that's not true. It can't, it can't be true. So, but beside that, everything has been tried. Every counselor, every type of counseling method that he's been shuffled around to every expert probably in a try, in, all, in Minnesota at least. The one thing that hasn't been tried is just giving them back to me. I mean, he, I, we never had these problems, him and I, up till age seven. Like, I mean, it, it, it was not a problem. I had, he behaved fine for me um, and he was happy. And, and so let's, I would, I would think any sort of just court would just come to that conclusion of like, we've tried everything for years and it's only gotten exponentially worse. Let's try something just out of left field and give back to his father. We'll try a different method and we'll see and we'll check back in a year or six even give him six months and i promise he would be uh, well on the way to becoming a, ha a healthier happier little boy well and that i i think that's so so important that's such an incredible insight because the less you have had influence in his life the worse he has deteriorated both physically and emotionally yes so it yes, seems reasonable to try. I mean, I, I kind of have the sense that if he spent a year with you, just, just being your son, that, that so much would be healed because a lot of this is because he's, you know, in my view, he's being abused. He's being, um, he's being told something. I mean, there's not a, other cases where we allow parents to, to deceive their children and to give them complete misinformation as in this case. And I don't understand how the courts aren't saying, Wow, this mother is is a completely unfit mother. We need to yeah. find a place for this child to live where he's going to be safe and healthy. Yes, yes, and that's what needs to happen. And I guess we're just going to have to try to take it on in it like that. Um, I I I believe that there is no middle ground in this. That becomes the other fundamental, you know, one of the many fundamental challenges in this is like there is no compromise. I mean, you can't. How do you compromise? with such vastly different worldviews, approaches, visions of reality, however you want to describe it. Um, and so th they're going to, you know, it, it, something drastic is going to have to happen. And I guess I'm just going to have to, we're going to have to go for a custody and I guess try to make the case that Sarah's the problem or the unfit parent or lesser fit parent or something like that. Um, 
which is a challenge. It gets back to what you know we were just talking about. It's like when the system backs up the delusion and the institutions are compromised, you know, and corrupted, they you're going against the current, you're going against the grain. You know, so I mean, I, I, you know, I, I know I sound like I'm pessimistic, but it's really I am this. I just I'm at a loss. You know, like we, this is all just unnavigatable, uh, uncharted territory, and um, and I, you know, I, I like, uh, I know Jeff has challenges. Like, also we're watching that, and t- while we're doing this interview, this is happening with his case. We're like the, his judge can just come out of the blue and just say, you know, even though you spent months and months and thousands of dollars to get up to a point to make your case in court which is your God-given right under the Constitution, they can just say, no, we won't even hear it. Rubber stamp it and just let it go. Like, we're at that point. Well, and that's where the court systems, I mean, it's like you're, you're dealing with the court systems, you're dealing with the schools, you're dealing with the therapists, and, and it's like everybody's crazy but you. I mean, and that's, that, that's, where, that's where I feel like um, it's, it's very disturbing for our society. I mean, you mentioned how this is breaking down our, our families, but I feel like it's breaking down our societies when reality is now considered to be um, hate yeah. and where people are allowed to, to completely deceive a child and that that's, that's what is um, promoted and that, that teachers are told that they need to do this and uh, judges and therapists so where are you now with um, therapy and with, um, you know, helping him to, to at least question this cult that he's been indoctrinated into? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, uh, fairly recently in the past couple weeks, Miles was, so I have been successful in having Troy Weber Brown removed from the equation, at least for the time being. And that's a huge success that I'm very grateful for. Miles was put into a program in Minnesota called the Clara's House, and it's loosely affiliated with Centric Care still. It's based on some Catholic charity work and stuff like that. And we had some hopes that that would be a non, just, they're, they're not, they're neither affirming or non-affirming. They're more like they just would just, just honored my request to just not talk about the gender stuff at all hoping that could just be a middle ground and miles was taken there and he only lasted about a week um he because it's very group oriented and he is just that's just not the way his personality is um and he also didn't want to wear a mask and there is some links to that with autism you know with like sensory you know being annoyed by it and the the oversensitiveness you know that can come with that um, and so they quickly decided he was not going to be a fit in that program. Um, but a little bit of good came from that where I had enough input and I was, they had to keep me in the loop. And I, they, without, they unfortunately in a position where they can't take a side, but I think it was pretty clear that, um, they also agreed that what would help Miles immensely is to be re, uh, reunified with me. So hopefully they can put that in some kind of assessment that maybe we can use later if we do go back to court. Because it seems to be that the courts only pay attention to expert, uh, expert opinions. And when he was there, did you have a chance to, to watch him at all? I know some of these facilities do have like, you know, w- window mirrors so that parents can watch without the child knowing. Yeah, no, I wish. I, I, I'm, I'm just so... Um, yearning to get to the point where I can see him again. Um, but they've been successful at keeping this from happening so far. And eventually it's going to have to happen. And it's going to happen very similar to like how you and I are talking right now. I guess that's going to have to, that's going to be another obstacle that I'm going to have to try to figure out how to navigate so that, and unfortunately his mother's going to be right off the screen kind of coaching him. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's going to be a huge step. In well, this. and this isn't going to be a, Hey, guess what, Miles? You get to talk to your dad. It's going to be a, you have, you know, I mean, I don't know. I can't get into her mindset, but based on what you've told me, she's not going to be getting him excited to talk to you. She's going to be undermining you before you even get a chance to talk to him. Yeah. Yeah. It has. Yeah. It's, it's like sabotage. You know, it's like, it's like, now remember Miley, if he ever slips up and says, calls you anything but Miley, I mean, just, this could be a hundred little trip falls to get this screen to look down. So I will know more soon, (laughs) 
but uh, what can we do to what can you know anybody watching this is what can we do to help you uh well that's a good question um you know i i do have uh save miles social media I, I i have not been tending to it too much because um I, I kind of want to see, you know, where some of this stuff goes so I can actually have something significant or substantial to, to share. Right. But I think we're getting to that point again, where I can do that. And, um, and so if, if anybody cares to, um, you know, we have like a save miles YouTube channel and a save miles, uh, Twitter, which I really don't tend to too much. Um, and, uh, and, and you could just pay attention and try to share it, you know, and I know there are, there are some Facebook groups that have helped me immensely to connect me with other parents who are in similar situations, you know, so. And I want to encourage are, people to go to your YouTube channel um, and go to your page, because first of all, the YouTube channel has some pretty shocking video on there where you talk about the case notes that you were finally able to get, as well as some videos that it looks like Miles accidentally uploaded to YouTube and which, which are really disturbing and which to yeah. me is evidence enough that he's not in a safe environment and that he's not in a healthy environment, but also to go to your um, Save Miles page because as you said, you have to have lawyers to do all of this. I mean, you, you can't even um, talk to the school about not calling him Miley without a lawyer. You know, all of this requires lawyers, which is, which is expensive. And, and, um, and so helping you to, to pay for those would be really important. Yeah. Yeah. I, I try to have the attitude of like, this is a really messed up world and there's so many places that we need to be trying to help. Right. And so, and I don't like to take help. I try to be as self-sufficient in, in life as possible, but I I've had to bend on this and I, and enough help always keeps coming through to keep me in the battle. Um, and I, and I, we, I have an attorney who is amazing and he's, giving me, I mean, uh, a, a, for his time and his expertise and his skills, he's given me a, a incredible rate, you know, like a, you know, a good deal in order to afford it. Um, and so I guess if someone wanted to donate to our GoFundMe, we have a GoFundMe, uh, Save Miles um, GoFundMe, uh, that I could t uh, tell them that there's some good's going to come out of this. You know, my, my ultimate bigger goal is to be, I know like Jeff, you know, says like, you know, save James, save thousands, which is exactly right. Um, and with Miles case, you know, it's, if we can finally set some kind of precedent where, you know, even if it was in Minnesota, you know, um, that's going to become a case that has to get referenced if this comes up again, then we have laid the ground, we paid the price to lay the groundwork so that the next parent that comes along in this situation has laid, a, uh, laid some groundwork so they don't have to do this all from the beginning. Well, and that's so important because on some level, we need to get to the point where teachers are not automatically affirming these kids. I mean, yeah. to me, that is just ridiculous. And that, and that therapists have some accountability and that parents have some right to insist that biological reality matters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, my, uh, our friend, uh, Brandon Showalter, uh, I think is quoting somebody else. He, he said, and it's just become one of my favorite quotes, which is, um, biology is reality's last stand. It's like, if they conquer us on the biological reality front, then we have nothing to stand on, right? So it's, it's, it's reality's last stand. I also incorporate God into that. God is reality's last stand, you know? And, but um, to, to quickly address what you said about the schools, um, I have anyone that will ever listen, um, I, I put my two cents in here, is that I really think that schools at this point are just not a safe place to send your children. They, you just can't. I mean, they will undermine your child and they're just getting worse and they have been for a long time but they have gotten to a level now where like we just said well the first day they'll ask what their preferred pronouns are and the, and the the curriculum becomes this there's always trying to slip in covertly this gender stuff um at least for now and to, if this can ever be reversed and i hope it can but um for now i if i if it was up to me if i could get miles back and I, he was under my authority again he would not go to school like i would homeschool him that just needs to happen. And, and especially with this COVID stuff, that's complicating things even worse and not in our favor and not in our children's favor. So 
It's so interesting because I never thought I would be such a strong proponent of homeschooling, but now I tell anybody who can to do it because um, the schools are no longer teaching our children um, important skills like reading and writing and math. They are teaching them to question the very fundamental basis of reality, which is biology, and they're also actively undermining parents. Yes, yes. Yeah, if it like if it becomes this is very common sense, you know. But I'll just be another person that points it out. Is that, you know, it's like it becomes a money issue. You know, when we say like, well, some people just can't homeschool their kids because of they have bills to pay and they got mortgage to pay. Understandable. This, you know, but think about the, think about the monstrous lifelong amount of money that you and your child later can lose if they get wrapped up in this nightmare. And I promise you, it will be way more than you could ever make going to a job. So if there's any way for people to do these adjustments in their life and take the, you know, the cuts that are needed to just keep your child at home and safe from this, at least until this passes, and hopefully it will, um, it, it'll pay off in the long run. Yeah, I think that's important to note because um, the medical complications that these people have are tremendous. And the therapy bills, because, even though trans activists will say that these that transitioning is important, they we also know that they have higher rates of suicide and mental health issues, and physical complications as a result of medically transitioning than they would otherwise. So, so like you said, I mean the amount of money if you look at it in the long term that you're going to be saving by not having to to spend money on. Um, you know, these medical complications and therapy and heaven forbid, um, if you have to bury a child because of suicide, um, all of that is, is far more important. Um, and, 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 and one of the things that I think is that our society has forgotten that our role as parents is to parent our child. And um, as in your ex-wife's case and in a lot of other cases, it seems like parents are deciding that their role a parent is to be a friend or a buddy or a fellow cult member um, instead of being a parent. And these kids are not doing well. And I was thinking yeah. about how, you know, how fragile they are and the fact that we have kids who are feeling like being misgendered or having the wrong pronoun used is a form of violence. And yet we had generation that survived concentration camps and came out of that and were able to be productive members of society. And so we've done something really, we've done a huge disservice to these kids and we need to, to kind of go backwards and figure out where we went wrong and set it straight. Yes, yeah, I could not say it better myself. You are exactly right. So do you have anything else you wanna talk about before we wrap this up? Uh, no, Sounds I like think your we... dog might have something to say about this. Yeah, oh, always. <laughs> I'm just glad she made it to the end here. <laughs> but yeah, no, it, this is. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, just thank you so much for caring and um, keeping, uh, giving me an opportunity to give you an update. And um, and yeah, anybody that comes across this, it's uh, well. That first, th this channel, your channel, is the place to come. It seems to be like the gathering spot. I'm so proud of you for what you're doing. Put so much work into this. Um, and this is a really important subject i mean they're trying to bury this and a lot of other you know important social subjects you know under this whole covid thing but um and they're doing a good job but i it this i've noticed is so, is one is so important that people are still you know there's like we can't let this happen to our kids which is yeah. just we have no choice we can't let them do this it, it we are in danger of if we lose a generation and there's enough of a tipping point there's no recovery from it. So this is where our battle needs to happen now. Well, and I, I'm so thankful that you're fighting it and that you and Jeff and Rob and others are, you know, really on the front lines of this battle. And, and really, we need to do everything we can to make sure that you have the supplies you need to continue to fight this battle. And that's where I really just want to encourage people who are watching this to go to your page and to donate because, you know, we can, we can do, we can, you know, feel bad about it. We can pray, we can, you know, sit around and talk about it, but, but really we need to be part of the battle. And, and, and one way to do that is to provide you with the resources you need to fight at the front lines. Yeah. yeah well, that is true. Yeah. We need to actually go into action. And uh, yeah, if, 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 if every, every dime that's been donated to the Save Miles GoFundMe has gone to my attorney and he is giving me a great 
great. And trust me, like, you know, talk to Jeff. We've seen in, on, you know, out in the open how much Jeff has had to throw at his battle. And, uh, and so far, you know, it's been very kind to me. So I, and, and, the, and the, the resources are always just enough. And I attribute that to God and everybody that's paying attention has given donations. So just thank you to everyone that already has. And if you care about this, I promise 